welcome everyone to our review of Unit 6 of the Certified Stormwater Operator and SESC Inspector Training Manual, which covers the requirements for administering and enforcing Part 91 programs. It would be beneficial for you to follow along with the manual during the presentation. The manual pages that correspond to the presentation slides can be found in the lower right-hand corner of the slide. EGLE implemented Part 91 legislation with the development of rules for a unified soil erosion and sedimentation control program. The legislation sets up the framework and the agency sets rules that provide additional information about the requirements for implementation and how to operate within the framework. Part 91 of the NREPA is the law, formerly known as Act 347 of 1972. It is a law passed by the state legislature that regulates what will or will not be permitted by law. The Part 17 rules are administrative rules authored by governmental departments or agencies spelling out the details and how the law will be carried out in order to uphold the law. Both are enforceable. Both can be found in the appendix at the end of the unit um, in the manual. There are three primary agency types under Part 91. First are enforcing agencies. Counties are mandated by legislation to administer and enforce Part 91. A specific agency is, is designated by the County Board of Commissioners to administer the program, issue permits, monitor compliance, and enforce Part 91. These are known as County Enforcing Agencies, or CEAs. Cities, villages, and townships have the option to be an enforcing agency too. These are known as Municipal Enforcing Agencies, or MEAs. Authorized public agencies, or APAs, are state and local agencies who are authorized to implement their own approved SCSC procedures related to earth changes. Examples of APAs include, but are not limited to, MDOT, DNR, County Road Commissions, and County Drain Commissioner's Offices. Lastly, there is EGLE, which provides training, compliance assistance, and program oversight. CEAs are required to implement Part 91 through either a resolution or an ordinance. If using a resolution, their program must be the same as Part 91. If using an ordinance, their program may be more restrictive than Part 91. MEAs must have an ordinance. All ordinances must be approved by EGLE. So what's the difference between a resolution and an ordinance? A resolution is a document that states the county is going to accept Part 91 as written. All fines go to the state, going to a local, um, a location determined by the state, and in this case is the Law Library Fund. An ordinance is a document that may be more restrictive than Part 91, and fines can go to the local agency. Ordinances cannot be less restrictive than Part 91, in other words, it cannot make lawful, which is not lawful in Part 91. It cannot create an exemption or take away an exemption in the law. An example of a more restrictive ordinance would be changing the distance needed from a water body to require a permit from 500 feet to 100 feet. <clears throat> All ordinances must be approved by EGLE, and the agency must have the ability to enforce their more restrictive ordinance. Occasionally, ordinances and resolutions need to be updated. Changes to your ordinance or resolution must go through EGLE for approval. Call district, district staff if you are planning on making changes to your ordinance or resolution for guidance. One of the primary roles of enforcing agencies is to issue and enforce SCSC permits. So what needs to be protected? Sensitive areas, which are areas easily impacted by sediment, such as lakes, streams, and wetlands. Critical areas, which are areas that are hard to stabilize, such as slopes, areas of concentrated flow, highly erodible soils, and drought soils. Part 91 protects adjacent properties, which is why we are concerned about track out. Some materials from a construction site could cause health and safety concerns, like rock being thrown from the wheels of equipment. What about unpermitted sites? Enforcing agencies are responsible for regulating earth changes at sites regardless of whether or not there is a permit. So even though a site may not require a permit, 
you still need to follow the Part 91 rules and take measures to control erosion issues and keep sediment on site. Here is an example of an un unpermitted site. The site is a half acre in size, but it has heavy track out on the roadway. The enforcing agency may issue a violation of Part 91 standard and will make the owner keep the roadway clear, clean during construction. SCSC permits are required when an earth change takes place within 500 feet of a lake or a stream. A lake is defined as one acre of open surface water and a stream is defined by definite bed and banks with visible evidence of continued occurrence of water. A permit is also required for work one acre or more in size. As you can see in the picture for reference, an acre is almost the size of a football field. If an earth change is greater than five acres, then the, then the landowner has to apply for a notice of coverage or NOC from Eagle. This is done after receiving the SCSC permit from the enforcing agency. It is very important for the landowner names to be consistent between the SCSC permit and the NOC applications. If the name on the NOC application does not match the name on the SCSC permit, then the application is considered incomplete. The next few slides will provide an overview of permit exemptions. However, the statute and rules should be consulted for specifics. In addition, please note that only plowing and tilling is exempted from the definition of an earth change in Part 91. Therefore, all of these other exemptions are exempt from permitting requirements only, but may still be subject to enforcement provisions. Plowing and tilling for crop production are exempted from the definition of an earth change. Examples that do not constitute plowing or tilling include building a barn, digging a ditch, construction of a farm road, stump removal, and installation of a drain tile. Under House Bill 4606, passed in 2016, farmers can construct and remove fences, remove trees and shrubs, install drainage or electrical lines, and build ponds under five acres in size without first obtaining a Part 91 permit from the enforcing agency. The acts of logging and mining are exempt. However, permits are still needed for access roads, ancillary activities, and clay, gravel, sand, peat, and topsoil mining. Ancillary activities might include the construction of a building or equipment storage areas. If these areas are one acre or more, then a permit would be required. Additionally, stump removal is not exempt and, and would require a permit. Earth changes associated with well locations, surface facilities, flow lines, or access roads related to oil or gas exploration and development regulated under Part 615 of the NREPA are exempt if the application for a permit to drill and operate under Part 615 contains an SCSC plan approved by EGLE. Normal road and driveway maintenance such as grading and leveling that does not increase the width or length of the road or driveway and that will not contribute sediment to lakes and streams is also exempt from requiring an SCSE permit. Additional exemptions include minor earth changes that are stabilized within 24 hours of the initial disturbance, as well as activities undertaken by the property owner on residential property such as gardening, digging post holes, and the removal of tree, stru tree stumps, shrub stumps, or roots resulting in an earth change not to exceed 100 square feet, as long as these activities do not result in or contribute to soil erosion or sedimentation of the waters of the state or a discharge of sediment off site. Enforcing agencies are required to keep documentation relative to Part 91, including the SCSE application, plan, permit, and inspection reports. The first three have information required by the state. There are forms available on EGLE's website if an enforcing agency would like to use them. These sample forms have all the minimum elements required under Part 91. It is recommended that these documents be kept uh, for at least five years. During an audit, EGLE staff will ask to see your inspection reports. This is your documentation that you are monitoring a site. An agency will not pass their audit if documentations of inspections cannot be provided. 
There are 13 required elements of an SCSC plan. The expectation is that all plans <clears throat> will have these elements. When Eagle performs an audit, staff will look for these items in the plans. This tends to be where we find the most errors during our audits. All plans must include a site map with a scale of at least 200 feet or less to an inch, a legal description that identifies property boundaries and proof of ownership, a site location sketch roughly identifying where in the county or township the project is located, the site's proximity to lakes and streams. The plan should identify where the nearest water body is. Predominant land features, which can be roads, trees, buildings, and so on. <clears throat> Contour intervals or a slope description to identify which way water will run on the site. Soils information, what type of soils are present at the site. This can be written on the map or attach a page from the county soils book, the NRCS web soil survey, or other resources. Limits of the earth change should delineate the area of disturbance. Clearly indicate on the map so that another person reviewing the plan knows what the limit is. No disturbance should take place outside of this limit. A description and location of all existing and proposed on-site drainage and dewatering facilities must be included. The timing and sequence of construction activities. When will temporary measures be installed? When will grading begin? Think about phasing and staging throughout the duration of the project. Placement of temporary SCSC measures and installation instructions placement of permanent SESC measures and installation instructions, and finally, a maintenance program for permanent SESC measures. For example, if a check dam is installed, who is going to, who is tasked with maintaining it? Or if a retention or detention pond is installed, who is tasked with cleaning it? This slide lists the requirements that apply to all earth changes, not just those under permit. They include limiting the duration of the earth change, removing sediment from runoff, the stormwater leaving the site must be clean. Limit flows to non-erosive velocities. We don't regulate velocity and volume of water, it just has to be non-erosive. Install temporary measures upon or before the earth change. And finally, install permanent measures within five days of final grade. Inspections are required to minimize soil erosion. Eagle's expectation is that the enforcing agencies are inspecting sites at a minimum of once a month on top of the weekly and storm event inspections performed by the permittee. The law requires <clears throat> that inspections occur to minimize soil erosion. Eagle recommends the enforcing agency perform a minimum of four inspections per site prior to permit issuance so has minimum minimization of erosion been considered? Does the plan match the actual site? Next, at the start of construction, are BMPs in place and functional? Then during construction, is the site in compliance with the permit? Are there any changes in site conditions? And finally, before closing out the permit, is the site fully stabilized? Keep in mind, if the site has critical or sensitive areas, more inspections may be needed. So how do we know when a site is stabilized? As defined by the Part 17 rules, stabilization means the establishment of vegetation or the proper placement, grading, or covering of soil to ensure its resistance to soil erosion, sliding, or other earth movement. Here are some enforcement tools agencies can put into their ordinance or resolution when it's being developed to get people to follow their permits. Using bonds, cash, certified check, or an irrevocable letter of credit is a way to get payment from people not following their permit. An agency may also seek out court injunctions, issue a cease and desist order, and issue fines. 
Enforcing agency corrective actions may be used. This is where an agency may construct, implement, and maintain SCSC measures to bring a site into compliance, then bill the landowner or place a lien on the property for the expenses incurred from the corrective actions. An agency may also double the permit fee. This must be authorized in, in an ordinance or resolution and be clearly defined as a fee and not a fine. There may be more examples than just the ones listed here. Here are enforcement options only allowed under an ordinance. Appearance tickets or municipal civil infractions. Think of them similar to a speeding ticket. Stop work orders. This is where all work or activity on a site must stop. In these cases, no other contractor can proceed with any other work. Other options for bringing more sites under permit could include requiring permits for Part 91 violations, like a sediment discharge or lack of SCSC measures, and proximity to wetlands and surface water inlets and catch basins. Always consult corporate counsel before taking escalated enforcement. It's important to remember during ordinance or resolution development that we have an enforcement procedure in place to provide enforcement on a consistent basis. And enforcing agencies must have the ability to enforce what is in the ordinance. These are the maximum penalties set by law. The enforcing agency may set up a fee schedule within what is defined in Part 91, but it cannot exceed it. The landowner may be fined up to $2,500 for violations of Part 91. A person who knowingly violates Part 91 or knowingly makes a false statement in a permit application or SCSC plan is responsible for a fine of not more than $10,000 for each day of violation. A person who knowingly violates Part 91 after receiving a notice of violation is responsible for a fine of between $2,500 and $25,000 for each day of violation. A person who violates Part 91 is also liable to the state for damages for injury to or destruction of or loss of natural resources resulting from the violation. Listed here are some other options for compliance and enforcement by enforcing agencies. This list is not in the manual, but are good things for agencies to think about when implementing their program. Approving good SCSC plans makes it much easier for agencies to enforce the plans. Agencies can supply permittees with handouts, checklists, and di diagrams to help the permittee with plan development and permit applications. Pay by inspection is when an agency has a difficult site that constantly needs inspection. Anything outside of the four inspections can be charged. Another option is to charge the landowner for any technical reviews made for permitting the site. Here are the things an agency can expect during an audit. The on-site conditions will really dictate how deep Eagle will dig into the other facets of their program. If Eagle encounters problems during the audit, there is an opportunity for the agency to make corrections, just like when an agency is conducting an inspection at a site. It is better for everyone to fix the problem when we work together than not. The enforcing agency's program can be put on probation until the issues are corrected and we can approve the program. With MEAs, Eagle can disapprove the program and the MEA will have to rescind the program. If dealing with a CEA, Eagle can get someone qualified to administer the program at the expense of the county since the legislature requires every county have an enforcing agent. Authorized public agencies or APAs are always state and local agencies. APAs do not need to get permits because Eagle has approved procedures for the agency to follow and requires staff to be trained. The objectives of an APA are the same as for enforcing agencies. Examples of APAs include MDOT, DNR, road commissions, drain commissions, and public works departments. 
The agency must develop SCSC procedures and submit them to EGLE for approval, detailing how the agency will address SCSC issues on earth changes undertaken by the agency or on behalf of the agency. The SCSC procedures must comply with all requirements of Part 91. SCSC plans that comply with Rule 1703 requirements must be developed for all projects which would require a permit if the agency was not an APA. For example, earth changes that disturb one or more acres or within 500 feet of the water's edge of a lake or a stream. An exception for this is for projects that are routinely undertaken by the agency. The agency may develop specific guidelines for undertaking those projects, and if those guidelines are approved by EGLE, no SCSC plans are required. APAs are exempt from obtaining permits from the enforcing agencies, but shall notify the enforcing agency of each proposed earth change. APAs must perform and document inspections of earth changes, and APAs are also responsible for the actions of contractors and subcontractors for projects under the jurisdiction of the APA. As with enforcing agencies, great plans yield great results. This is true for APAs as well. APAs often have the upper hand because you can control the money. You can control whether or when the contractor gets paid and performance incentives work well where the project finishes early. This would be a win for the contractor as they get a bonus and the APA gets the project done before the deadline. On the flip side of performance incentives is to include a penalty provision in the contract. APAs are generally good with inspections during the active construction. It's after the earth change and before stabilization when most problems occur due to diminished inspection and field presence. It's important to keep a strong presence on the site until the site reaches final stabilization. EGLE conducts audits of APA programs on a five-year cycle. The audit is basically the same process as with an enforcing agency. The main difference is the results. The audit would result in an approval or a disapproval and move to rescind the program. Here is a list of EGLE's Part 91 responsibilities. EGLE is responsible for promulgating rules to administer Part 91, approve resolutions and ordinances for enforcing agencies and procedures for APAs, periodically conduct performance reviews at least every five years and approve or disapprove the agency, inspect sites for compliance with Part 91, issue orders or consent orders, seek fines for violations and noncompliance, develop and provide training such as the one you're attending right now, and determine state prescribed information to be included on the SESC application and permit forms. And this concludes our review of Unit 6 of the Certified Stormwater Operator and SESC Inspector Training Manual. Next up is a review of Unit 7, which covers soils, erosion, and runoff.